So uh, welcome everybody. Uh, my name is Stephen Phillips. I'm the director of the Cal Poly Los Angeles Metropolitan Program in Architecture and Urban Design. Uh, we are an off-campus program for Cal Poly San Luis Obispo uh, here in Los Angeles. We have about 30 plus students uh, who come down for the basically the year we're taught here in LA. And we run an event series, uh, usually through the Helms uh, Design Center. Um, which uh, obviously we've adjusted to the new normal and are online with these uh, Zoom webinars. And we decided to up them up a little bit. So we have one every Thursday night at four o'clock uh, Pacific Standard Time. And tonight we have a, an exceptional one. I'm very excited um, with uh, Moss, uh, Hillary Sample, and um, Michael Meredith. So, uh, Probably just before we get started, I'm just gonna, I usually like to give a shout out to our sponsors. We have a bunch of fellowships and scholarships and events uh, which get supported by the Helms Bakery District, HMC Architects, Morphosis Architects, Erie and Partners, AC Martin, Co-Architects, Marmal Rad Center, Theater DNA, Boltau, Arc uh, Document Solutions, and we have media support from LAAIA, Archonnect, and KCRW DNA. So, um, with no uh, further ado, generally we're gonna run about a lecture for an hour, although I think Michael and Hillary are open to us engaging in a discourse and maybe um, interrupting as we please, and then we'll get into a Q&A as well, uh, which will open up to attendees who are there out there. Um, so just raise your hands if you have a question and we'll get to you uh, in the second half. So um, Michael Meredith and Hillary Sample are architects and founders of Moss. They met at Syracuse University, where they each received a Bachelor of Architecture degree uh, back in 1994. Um, Michael Merrick, is that a mistake? Oh, 94, 94. Yes, no, yeah. that's correct. Yeah, sorry. You wrote it, I, you know, it? surprise. Uh, Michael Meredith received a Master's of Architecture with distinction from Graduate School of Design at Harvard University. Um, that's 2000. And Hilary Sample received a Master of Architecture and the Suzanne Colrick Thesis Prize from Princeton University in 2003. Currently, Michael uh, Meredith is a professor of architecture at Princeton University. Uh, his previous teaching positions include professorships at Harvard University's Graduate School of Design, the University of Toronto's Faculty of Architecture, Landscape and Design, and a Muschenheim Teaching Fellowship at the University of Michigan uh, back in 2000, 2001. Hilary Sample is presently a professor at Columbia University Graduate School of Architecture, Planning and Preservation, and has previous, ta previously taught at Yale University in 2005 and 2011, um, and at the State uh, University of New York at Buffalo as the Rainer Bannum Teaching Fellow uh, back in 2004 and 2005, and at the University of Toronto Faculty of Architecture, Landscape and Design back in 2003-2004. So together they have uh, been visiting critics at the University of Southern California, Martell Lectures at SUNY uh, Buffalo, uh, the Fitzhugh Scott Endowed Chairs in Design Excellence at the School of Architecture and Urban Planning at the University of Wisconsin at Milwaukee, and were the inaugural chairs for the University of Michigan Taubin College Practice Sessions. We're super excited to have them here tonight to give a lecture and discussion on um, some images. Right. <laughs> images of things. Anyway, uh, super excited and uh, our students are excited. So we also have our students in the view here. You can see. Go for it, you guys. Okay, great. All right. Thanks, Stephen. Can everyone see the screen? I guess, can you see it? Stephen, can you tell us whether you can see it? Yeah, okay, yeah, great. All right, great. Great, well, thank you so much for inviting us um, to you and sponsors for sure. And uh, it's great to see everybody. i surprised already somebody from Australia, super nice to, uh, do this is our first, I guess, Zoom lecture. Uh, so, <laughs> in the in the new normal, um, I think we wanted to. Um, as we were working on this before everything happened, um, our lives were really abruptly uh, shifted, like many many people. Um, and so we're um, had already sort of started putting this together, and now just kind of continue. But I think we wanted to just talk about the work in the office um, and and show it really from the kind of way that we've been thinking most recently uh, through projects from small to large. So that's it, it's kind of simple, uh, straightforward. We're really a small office, uh, just about like five people plus ourselves. 
Uh, we live above our office, um, so our life and our work is commingled. Um, and so even, you know, in this kind of first image, uh, just showing the work, a little bit of the workspace, this kind of first set of images uh, and a, a drawing from our daughter. Um, but let's see here, if this goes forward. There we go. Yeah, okay, great. I, 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 You're gonna tab, okay. Michael's gonna <laughs> DJ, I suppose. I'll DJ. Okay, anyhow, so just uh, some, some glimpses of, of the work. We've been, I think, trying to make a practice for a while now focused on buildings, um, objects, books and really working between those two things, uh, books and buildings, uh, and then everything else kind of in between. Um, and so this is really just first set of images shows and speaks to that uh, work that we're doing. Uh, we're also, um, uh, this is a more recent book that just was published uh, that looks at the kind of history of houses and you know explores in a hopefully a fun and delightful way uh, the a kind of tour of houses uh, through a family and their hunt for a house uh, when it's really about a kind of search for architecture. Um, so working through a uh, medium of drawing and bookmaking, um, researching houses. Um, some of the houses are ones we studied a long time ago. Um, others are more contemporary um, and, and also looking at the kind of life of these buildings beyond um, how they're typically represented, I think. I think we're just going to go uh, kind of quickly. There's a lot of images, but we, the, like Kelly was saying, we're going from the spoon to the city kind of model, uh, small to large, it, to show the body of work. These are some books. We're constantly making books uh, in the office as part of the office, and we're constantly we are constantly doing a mix of things that are both, let's say, uh, commissions work as well as just Invented projects. Invented projects, for sure. So this is a scale figures book that came out of an installation for the Istanbul Biennial we were invited to, where we looked at scale figures. We took away, we just started with drawings and took away the architecture. And what was left was a collection of figures um, put together uh, as an encyclopedia. It's very much unfinished, is what we called it. Um, but played around with the idea of, of the book and an encyclopedia in particular. And this, this is a project that we were participating in Venice by a few years ago where we looked at a site in Detroit called the Tinder Cut uh, and made a proposal for housing as well as a kind of crew space through a set of forms that we generated looking at um, ideas around thinking lots and boundaries and property lines uh, through a type of courtyards, um, which is maybe not so typical to Detroit fabric, um, and put together a model, but also a book. In this case, it's, it's slightly repetitive, I suppose, over and over again, all these things, but, uh, and here also generating scale figures. Uh, the book also included invited uh, other um, architects and authors to write, uh, very much about book, but not just about representation of the image or figures, but also a set of collection of texts that we've, we've worked on um, together uh, in the office, but also um, I think in all of our books we try to invite uh, people to participate um, and have a voice yeah. in architecture. We tend to do, a, these are other projects that are kind of, that we do to reflect on architecture in a way for us, and so that we've done I'm not, we're not really showing a lot of the, I guess we've been around long enough now that we have earlier work, but um, that uh, we used to do a lot more, let's say videos uh, and software, writing software. And it, there were the kind of, there were always projects to be thinking about architecture in a way. And, and this was in that, I have to say, series where we started to look at, um, we set up a shop on our previous website before this, we used to have a website that was just a shop and like to sell uh, doodads and tchotchke in a way. So this was one of the, this was the first thing we made for the shop. It was, uh, they're all productions. They're not really reproductions, uh, but some people thought they're not. Um, 
and we wrote little stories about them. So it was, uh, they were a way for us to deal with, let's say, problems that were taught to us as students. One of the things I was always told, and we were always told in school, um, that there were two types of architects. There was uh, the Joseph Hoffman type and the, and the Adolf Loth type was the kind of serious conceptual architect and the gadfly um, commercial architect. So for us with this, you know, we're, we have, th have this kind of uh, talk to us. And then at the same time, when we, we see as the young teachers when we were doing this or relatively youngish, uh, like a lot of people graduating and then just doing 3D printed vases and trying to sell them on Etsy in a kind of weird world that we're in at the moment. So we made up these stories and objects. Uh, I don't, it's all on the website too, if you want to see, but we stopped selling them. There was no money in it. Can't really run an office <laughs> off of it. It would take us two days to figure out how to package it. Like some, some people would just get obsessed about everything. This is a soap. Bob soap. A lot of the, the games are kind of playing with like, let's say non-design in general. The, the text or um, like so dish supposedly like and also it's always unknown it's like a Mies van der Rohe soap dish not really sure if he did it or not it says but and there are also ways for us to fun with our ideas and 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 acknowledge other architects we um, positivist cutting boards. Anyways, these are other objects we were making while we were doing bean bags that were like rocks, sort of soft rocks, bean bags. A lot of furniture. We're constantly doing furniture in the office. It seems like, and we're doing more of it. Um, this was done at the same time as the scale figures. We made also collections of model furniture. We haven't published this yet. It's still kind of in kind of disarray working on it, but we would collect um, some of these little crude pictures of uh, models of furniture that architects would put notational furniture and then try to make new furniture out of it. So this was done off of a model and a sedum a model of a chair and a sedum model kind of redone uh, in a different material obviously they're all paper we're doing it all in aluminum you know Bobardi. anyways we were making a lot of copies of like model like furniture that were from models of furniture And then some are just also experiments. This is just a tectonic experiment. Let's say something we, there's not, this is just us looking at how to make a table just with two uh, layers of quarter inch aluminum sort of overlapping. Other chairs and pieces that we were making out of this is out of one one part kind of reassembled and assembled uh, this was a show we did in the fall of last year and um, it's it's a guy who does small shows a kind of pop-up design shows this was in Lotra in one of the rooms there. So we just did a series with different, actually there's other people involved. We worked with Mary Ping 
from slow and steady when the race on his jacket, we use um, uh, images of, of, uh, of white noise on, on these kind of jackets. And then uh, we made up more chairs that could be uh, sort of easily shipped and put it on a backpack and reassembled chair. This is a one part chair also. Uh, this was, we did a whole monastery thing. We did these kind of block shoes and then we did these kind of uh, candelabra things. Um, <laughs> We worked with John Hogan, who's a glass artist in Seattle on the glass work, magnifying glass. Um, and yeah, these are kind of old ways of like, uh, to look at uh, sort of uh, lighting devices that we looked at pre modern. The show was called T Total Spiritual Boredom. Uh, this was a now closed, I guess, ADO in Brooklyn uh, design. Uh, center. Uh, we were one of the first, we did, one, I think, the first installation there, but uh, it, we did a series of, of modular system that they could turn in for, di use for different performances in different venues, polished aluminum. And with it, we made these jackets. Again, we worked with Mary Ping from these kind of jackets uh, in Mylar for everyone working on it when it had to be assembled and disassembled kind of like a uniform we worked with mary also on an office uniform i don't think we have pictures of it but we have a kind of office lab coats and stuff they were at the beginning of the yeah. thing, thing something like 10 different hidden pockets for all the tools yeah needed. ipad pocket in the jacket and plates. yeah it's a ton of pockets there and we did a book for it with all the different configurations and a sticker book. I think we lost them. Stephen, you're muted. No, I'm, I'm on. Yeah, it looks like they're the, back. They're back. Yeah, there you are. We, we anticipated some. Sorry. Yeah, there'll be some timing out. It's okay. Sorry about that. Okay. Upstate New York, right? It's reality. Yeah, we're really in the woods. Um, an exhibition at Princeton called Low Resolution Houses. Uh, I don't know, this was a couple of years ago now. These are kind of material samples from each house. Um, They're all houses. I mean, for, in a way that a lot of the work that we do, like the exhibitions or the writing in some cases, are just to kind of looking at architecture. And it seems like, at a, I, I think at the time, uh, looking at a kind of trend, which I would say was, is, um, uh, is looking at a kind of lower resolution houses, I guess, but lower resolution construction, kind of going against a high technological impulse of architecture that I think has been in the field for the 90s and the noughties, perhaps, like a kind of push towards expertise, et cetera. And then there's maybe moving in. Thank you guys. Project for uh, Paris. Are we here? Hello? Yeah, we can hear you. You come and go a little bit. You're there. Um, do you want to elaborate a little bit on the low res stuff before you, you move forward? Because a lot of people argue, I guess, about what you meant by that. And it was pretty substantive on the profession and industry of thinking. It was? <laughs> yeah, well, um, it spread all the way out to the West Coast. Um, it mattered. 
I think some people, in a way, it's it's part of the same. I would say the same project we've been sort of part of, which has been a, in a way, against um, uh, the high, like sort of like uh, the par in a way the par it's easy to attack a parametric nowadays but the parametric project was kind of the project of architecture when we started and we were part of it even to some degree and then I think we started to have a re I think a lot of us and maybe could argue about it is kind of had a reaction against it where it didn't seem, the technology, let's say all of this technology did not seem like it was progressive ultimately or moving towards something necessarily what it promised. I mean, so there is a kind of sense of an architecture that was not, I think high res in a way was in a, in a crude, sense with were, were things that really uh, sophisticated um, expensive required a lot of uh, expertise in terms of let's say software etc and low res was a is a kind of other world cheaper cruder um, I don't know. I'm not really sure how to go further with that. I mean, it's actually, I'm not, a, it's literally like a couple of years, so I can't even say, I had it in a slightly different space. Um, I wrote about it at the time. It's somewhere, I'd have to look at it, reread it even to be more accurate. But it's in a way, I don't know what people talk. Some people have it as Neo Poma, which really, me, but, um, it's not about, I never thought of it as neo homo, but I can understand how somebody would, might think that, but it's not, it was never about that. I think some people, whenever they see, and I can't, I can understand it when anybody sees a pitched roof, some people just think of homo, whereas like pitched roofs for us are just in the world. It's not a, it's not a lingui a semiotic thing. You know what I mean? They're already, they're there. They're just, they're efficient, they shed water, they're it's not even necessarily, they're cheap. So, you know, it's not, it's not like it's, we're interested I, in um, language of architecture in the sense of like, a, yeah, a semantic architecture like that. I think there, if anything, it's more of a generic than it is. It's almost, uh, has less, it's, than, like than it being f like full of of words and meaning it's probably has it's more empty in a way for us more flexible so um <laughs> corridor house it's a part of but it's like that over this was, we did a series of studies, which we don't have, of just looking at corridors of big houses and just imagining and living inside of them. And then, and then remade this kind of uh, full scale model. I think if we started the uh, through type topology of houses, we continue to return to that whether we're building them or not in the office and researching them and trying to understand them and particularly the idea of the American house and how it's transformed. Those are some of the ideas behind that project. This is um, for the Miami Design District. We were asked to design a storefront three feet, five feet high, um, no tenant. Um, so we and at the previous studies through software, also tried to look at an idea of materials, durability, maintenance, uh, and kind of one material um, sort of square windows that we use. Um, this is a project currently um, in construction documents. We put some stuff in that's just 
kind of in the works at the moment. Uh, this is a, a series of cabins uh, in upstate New York. We're looking at a, at a, um, we're kind of, we're trying to work on a new, like a, a really simple and sustainable, hopefully, construction system where we're working with folded, taking some of our, in a way we've developed a kind of, uh, despite all the things I was saying about expertise, we've just, we've developed a kind of expertise in, in folded metal, I think. We use SolidWorks a lot. And so this is a series of large, uh, we've worked through a kind of system of uh, folded metal. In this case, it's core 10 and, uh, and uh, EPS foam blocks that are about four feet by two feet. Um, and so, and then we have a kind of systems for thermal bridging and stuff like this, but it's a super simple, fast system working with Selman on developing it right now, but we've kind of got it figured out. Um, this will have a green roof planted. Still being worked on, so it may change, or they, they actually will change. This is a recent gallery. We don't have the photos yet. It kind of ended right in the COVID-19 started but it's a gallery in new york uh it's a very simple project renovation project with a mezzanine installed and lighting it's kind of new uh, kind of details as well lighting kitchen etc a house for another architect actually in south carolina uh, working on it's still in progress also but we're just showing some things. It's, it has these beautiful live oaks around it. So we are trying to use some of it and move it. It's basically has a series of those black dots or trees that go around. This is uh, where Stephen is currently. Elman House. Mm -hmm. This was a project we did, I don't remember when we did it, a while ago. Yeah, around 2000, I think we started around 2008, and finished around 2000, I'm not sure, 10, 12, something mm -hmm. like this. 10 before we left, came to New York. Yeah. yeah. Anyhow, um, this was for a client as a, an, a museum, which is concerned with, uh, which calls the outdoor arts. Um, and so there's a, a piece of land art on the site. Uh, and asked us to think about making a, a kind of visitor center, but that you could also stay overnight in. Um, so it has effectively three bedrooms. But the process began through thinking about growth. Um, we did sort of two versions. This was a kind of long house, as we called it. Uh, and then the one that was built, which is the more kind of array version. Um, and uh, again, it's a, it's a chance to look at the history of the American house, look at it for its parts, um, sort of to think about it in a very straightforward way. How do you gather those parts, aggregate those parts, repeat them, uh, make a collection of spaces, porches, keys, all of those things kind of also, like that. You have to, we also have gotten quite, I mean, it's incredibly cheap. Very small, 1500 square feet. Feet. It's made out of sips shipped. This is like we found. We put a like a small uh, fabric here for air, and then these are just these shingles we found. Uh, aluminum raw. The only place we could find raw aluminum shingles from a place in Oregon that, that we had shipped, but they were less than a dollar a shingle. Very, deep. Um, and but we used it to to um, work as a like um, a heat sink. That's why things are filleted here. So it's continuous aluminum everywhere. So when it's hot on one side, the heat can dissipate and move from the cool side over. Things like that. We try to use be intelligent with very limited means. Uh, these are also this kind of air that come through 
below, up to below the house, to um, the solar chimneys above and move up and cool. Cheap gutter, scupper detail. Uh, this is a recent project from last summer. We did, um, it's still there, we're still using it. It's for an outdoor school for children. It's part of ANSA, which is a, it's the school in Versailles, the French architecture school. And one of the things we did with it is um, we made another book, a big book. And then part of the book was, uh, this is the system, it's all folded aluminum. We had to learn, we had, I don't know if it's in here, I can't remember, but we did a project for um, the Guggenheim Bilbao, which, and then, which was also has a framework in, it's a tent that has, it's woven with um, shield X fibers from, from Germany, the, you know, there's no image. I don't know if it will show up, but it's um, to block out cell phone signals. And so, but we worked, we found a kind of really good fabricator we worked with in Spain um, and worked with them on this as well. So all folded metal, delivered side, assembled in a few days. Very simple system. But the idea here is that kids can come and learn about design and architecture. We also made a very long table and stools, some things we had done previously in other projects, like something for the CCA at all. Um, and then went to Chisa, Columbia. Um, here you can see the uh, assignments. And part of the book that we made, we had text to write one page assignments uh, for kids. Um, and yeah. so, and the height is based on children being able to tuck under the eaves, but grown ups can't, for instance. So. Um, and to be shaded, uh, cool, and open air. You know, so there's references in that in terms of education and playfulness and also architecture. So these are some of the, these are examples of some of the exercises that people made for the children. And they actually do teach them to the kids, which is pretty amazing. In fact, if anything, the, let's say the pedagogy is more, probably have, will have more impact than the building or whatever it is. Um, we hope. <laughs> I think also this has been something I've been doing is reading to kids also, which has been really amazing and rewarding experience part of that. Um, here we're working on a house uh, in St. Louis. Um, we're part of a group of architects working on uh, a kind of master plan. Uh, project master plan by Tatiana Bilbao, this office, and uh, working with her on a few projects. Um, this is one of them. Uh, again, kind of visiting, uh, rethinking what an affordable American house could be um, in this case. And we all uh, sort of come together on shared ground. So, how we actually engage in that um, and provide a, a, a new hopefully a kind of new thinking about the interior. Um, so for instance, the bedrooms, there are two bedrooms, they're the same size, uh, have the same kind of amenities. We're doing away with the idea of master bedroom, this idea of kind of master, and this is something we've done in almost all of the houses that we've worked on, um, really to read hierarchy and kind of history and list of that in terms of the house. Looking at brick, uh, St. Louis brick, um, rethought. Some things have changed. It's actually started, the CD, uh, it's, the foundations are going in right now, but the, anyways, underscore, we could talk about how value engineering works in the profession, but it generally is there. It's, it looks, it's pretty close. Um, this is a, this is, um, a store in New York. It's actually in the base of Neil Denari's um, HL23. HL23. The High Line. It's just yeah. under, tucked under the High Line. Um, so this is a, a, a space for design, and the client uh, was interested in commissioning and curating different artists and architects, designers to make objects that he would sell uh, in this space. Um, and so these are some of the images, the inherited 
as an empty commercial raw space, we inherited everything from the building and nothing needed for the space. So we had a pack full of more ducks and more wires. Crazy number of ducks. All these people, when they look at this, see vaults. We ducks. <laughs> Not I do. <laughs> it's just like it's all. These are all ducks. Between every vault is like a duct or a line or something. But it, um, at the same time, it allowed us to um, take up the scale of the metal work we had been doing and use that as part of the space, as well as then more experiments with materials. And you know, there's a small scale. These are not large scale. Projects. I think we try to make, we make a lot and we're very, uh, you know, I think at some level we're a conundrum even to ourselves in the sense of we're very much uh, media oriented, at, let's say, or image of things, but at the same time, very much about physical, the physicality of architecture. So we made this shopping system, we were really involved in the whole process, um, working with the shops. So this is, but this is marble that then we then, that is milled with the Alcad marble on top of the real marble within a kind of grommet and like kind of shelving system that is you can use rearrange for different shows. This is a proposal for a studio, uh, for an artist. It's, again, we're trying to really develop this. Uh, we were trying to work through the system it ended up in the in the Hudson project, but a kind of system of construction that was not framing based, that was just really crude and fast. And like in a way, our attitude towards sustainability is like the less processing and less people involved, the more sustainable it is probably. <laughs> so like if we have very fewer parts and we can deal with, um, um, less labor in a way too, it's going to become more sustainable. So this is just through these blocks with metal. It has this large roof and a series of skylights and, and stairs that can go up to it. So it's like this roof is a big collector of stuff, like I guess barbecues and tables. Are you guys seeing us? Can't hear you. Yeah, no, yeah we, can, we can hear you. We can see yes. you. We There's see probably you. a delay in the vision of you, but that's OK. This is a house in upstate New York. Yeah. Can I talk about it? Sure. Yeah. So and this is for a kind of extended family, intergenerational uh, ideas to live around a courtyard that's planted uh, in the whole house is set in a forest, uh, but each bar brought together represents a different program. So each bar is the program. Uh, and we treat three of the bars mm -hmm. as bedrooms. Uh, kitchen. A kitchen and then a, a kind, kind of, of arts room. Mm -hmm. The living room is really rethought and distributed around the courtyard. And so there's effectively different kinds of programs around the courtyard. So you could find your own space to occupy, be together, but be somewhat separate at the same time. We made the furniture for this. This is a kind of try to do everything for it, um, experiment using color something we generally don't use in the actual architecture, but the furniture affords kind of freedom and playfulness where we would be maybe too afraid uh, potentially to try that in, in architecture uh, because it becomes permanent. Um, I think here we also experimented with structure, so that trusses yeah. and in a way, us at least, but you know, comes out of perhaps corridor house and some way. These things are, are again revisited, changed, and, and tested. We've been using square windows uh, almost regularly. Um, so, a kind of, again, a sort of repetition of, of parts or elements that we now know how they work, how they perform, um, the cost of them.
and also the metal work is lightweight. It's easy to install with just one or two people. It's something we're also really interested in, again, the kind of labor main side of things. Probably too many photos of this. Yeah, let's keep going. This is also finishing up right now. A studio in New York for a photographer. These are some of the early models. It, it changed a lot for its lifetime. So this was an early scheme. There was, it was bigger. And then it is what it is now. Um, this, it's pretty much done. We don't have photo and I mean, our, we've been pretty limited in everything. Uh, but. It's a very simple building with a large uh, roof size studio and then a series of, again, these seven foot square windows and skylights that then uh, move throughout the space. One side is um, a double height space and the other side, it's like almost in half. Half is double height and half has two layers, has this plywood room above. This is a project in Brooklyn. It was a, it was a mixed project department and gallery. Um, there was an existing facade, which we then filled openings and then put new openings in. Um, it's a double heights, or it's not double heights, just a large space on the above and then it also has a roof garden. But these were kind of, um, again, op opportunities to really look at, well, there's a series of skylights. This is kind of uh, collect the skylights in the top that cut through the vaults. There's two vault systems, um, one that goes this way and one that goes that way. Um, Project is a very deep lot for New York. Typical lots are 100 feet, but you only build on maybe half. Um, for this kind of neighborhood. In this case, the ground floor went all the way to the lot line, which was at 117 feet, 120 feet roughly, but very deep. So the middle would become very dark. Um, and there was an interest to make the interior a conservatory in the living space. So that's the, the kind of reasoning for the light and the, the opening. We work, the with, uh, we work with the ceramicist a lot, actually. And even in the first, the floating house, uh, since then, we've worked with her on doing uh, tiles for all of our projects. And we don't have photos always of them, but this is one of them. To, and she did a lot of tile work with us. These are, one of the things we've been doing recently is for the last couple of years is, have been two uh, affordable housing projects in Washington, D.C. One of them is currently under construction and this other one hopefully will be soon. Um, so as we've been working on houses and studios and this kind of smaller scale projects, we've slowly been working on larger scale work. We're very interested in that um, to a degree and also doing work more for the public realm. Um, I'm really interested in involved teaching housing and um, so spending a lot of time and looking at issues around affordability and so through these projects, we've had the chance to work on that. These are townhouses. There's 26 units at the time. This project was proposed as affordable with market rate. Um, DC currently has, a, the mayor has an initiative to do a lot of affordable housing. And so in the midst of this project, it's now gone to be 100% affordable. So, you know, and sort of overnight, the project has kind of radically changed. Architects are all changes. In, um, so that's sort of one, one aspect of, of the project um, that we're looking at now. This is another group project. Um, this is with um, Mexico. In Mexico, with Tatiana uh, Bilbao, Derek Delacamp, Dogma, Mayo, Mayo Dogma, and HHF. HHF. Yeah. 
so there's a block um, in a, that's being uh, a, a kind of study uh, and subdivided um, effectively like a kind of check checkerboard. Each of the offices has two or multiple sites sort of paired within this um, proposing lots of housing and social housing for workers. Um, and then with variable um, communal program at the ground floor. Um, so this is our, our proposal in, in this, I would say, um, there's a kind of limitation on the square footage of the units themselves, a much stronger emphasis on the kitchen um, as a cultural piece, um, which is different and distinct than what we've seen in proposals that we've worked on in either New York or the projects we're currently doing um, in DC. So, but we're spending a lot of time working on that and thinking about these. We're told this could still happen. We'll see, hopefully. This is the other project that's currently under construction. Um, it, it's basically, it, it's, it's I, I, do you want to describe it? It's basically two courtyards, um, two blocks. It's an odd shaped site, 60, Three or four units? 60, 63 units. So, yeah. It's 100% it's affordable. It has also supportive housing uh, for formerly homeless. So there are 13 units for, for that and 50 units are, um, again, this affordable um, on the lower end of AMI uh, with the ground floor as being uh, commercial. Um, there are some units on one side, but uh, part of it does have a commercial component to it. So very uh, you know, a kind of one of these usual um, uh, affordable housing projects that has um, mixed uh, lending and funding. Uh, it's a kind of complex puzzle uh, that we've been working on. No photos yet, but it's, it's in progress. Um, this is a project we're working on right now uh, in Oaxaca. Um, yeah, and yeah. Uh, uh, a, a sort of proposal for uh, track and running space. You just flip that. So we'll see. Um, again, we have more interest in studying and, and looking at um, issues around public projects um, that we previously have done at school and Mark. So oh, we, we, have, we have a, a kind of balance of work. Um, in the U.S. and abroad, and we're interested in those things. This is looking at, that was looking at kind of housing for, for potential athletes. Here is a proposal that we worked on that was built, but we were invited to work as a kind of master plan architects, also design education building uh, for basically a space um, and program around affordable housing. Uh, and we helped with the kind of selection of the architects for this competition. Uh, and, and there were 32 architects selected to build their um, prototype for an affordable house that could then aggregate and produce a community. Um, so it's Mexican architects with some international architects for the prototype. Um, and this is our education building um, that made a kind of very porous education building. Uh, that you could walk through open air um, on the interior. Of course, there are doors and furniture for coming together in classrooms, lectures, um, and exhibiting of the drawings and models that the architects made. Um, there was a series of furniture made uh, as part of that. So, um, and large rotunda skylights and the, the rocks. The building with numbers. and the buildings made local local blocks that we then rework the idea of the glaze or finish on those blocks. So always trying to look at what's available locally, um, but just slight tweaks to that. Here we also made a book for part of this uh, and um, again invited others to write and contribute texts. We also invited the architects just to write texts about their work uh, and talk about local or vernacular uh, architecture that influenced them in their thinking about their projects. There were 32 because there are 32 states in Mexico, so one, one house per state, um, and represented also the 10 different microclimates of Mexico, um, although they had to rework the projects to be built at this location just north of Mexico City. So we, we wanted to sort of end, this is the end. We sort of uh, start with the books and end with the books. But um, 
hopefully, can you guys, we can't ever, we can't it's sort of uh, really a void here for us. If we can't tell if we're, thank you, here he is. <laughs> if we're jar, all garbled or. Uh, you were slightly garbled, but I think we all attentively listened. Probably with enthusiasm. Um, are you finished? Yeah, I think we're finished. Okay, can you unshare your screen? I think it slows you down a little bit. Yeah. yeah. Okay. How's that? Is that better? We can also turn off our video. Yeah, no, it is better to hear you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's good. Uh, well, thank you. Okay, good. And I'm sorry that you guys it turned into a lecture, but I think it was better to get through the picture stuff because now we can really kind of engage in a conversation with you. Um, of course, I always have a lot of questions yeah. and then everyone else can start asking questions. Um, you know, you, again, the low res thing was interesting to me. And then you set it up as a provocation once almost originally that it somehow you decided to move in this territory as many uh, people have um, against sort of a tradition, well, it became the tradition, right? The traditional obsession with complexity, you call it high tech or computer technology taken to an extreme where it's not necessarily achieving anything. And then you shift it over to low res, but then you also say you're very uncomfortable talking about yourself in terms of Neopomo, which I don't blame you at all, but yet you use pink. You love to use pink in all your colors, uh, not on the buildings, but in all the yeah. vendors, which I thought was fantastic and interesting. Um, can, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, and, and, then, and then you also do a lot of other things that people might associate with traditional postmodernism. Uh, in most people that we've talked to recently will call it more of a cartooning. Uh, you're, I think, a little not really cartooning. You're simplifying with intelligence, which is really important. But I'm yeah, wondering. I don't think we do. I'm wondering why you don't want to. Like, what is your resistance? Your concerns? Your uh, yeah, that's a good. Point. Uh, I mean, I think we always like. I, I mean, I think we're aware we we sometimes touch upon it or, or come close to it, but I don't think we embrace it. Um, and why don't we embrace it? I mean, I think we always like this. I always, we say we, the space between sort of things. So it's like, uh, of course, Venturi Scott Brown is in the work a little bit for us, but also I think Louis Kahn is and Gary, I mean, there's a lot of things in the work and if you want it to be in there. At the same time, I think it's also very, in a way, banal in some cases, you know, architecturally, it's not, it's, it's like a, it, hopefully we can touch upon a lot of things. I think the thing with postmodernism or POMO at least for us, I don't know, I don't, I just think it's a, it's a different times. I do think there's things going on in the field right now, which we, we all characterize as, Neopomo, and I'm really interested in understanding what this Neopomo is, even in a way, but that's going on because you see it and we all see it, especially people with teaching. And, but it's not the same thing as it was. I mean, postmodernism was kind of um, obsessed with, I think, obsessed with, you know, language and semiotics and kind of like systems of, of thinking. And this is not that, this is more like moods and um, affect even, and things like this being played out in a different, with a different uh, set of images perhaps, I think, but I'm not sure. Yeah, I'm not sure either. Cause I, you know, I worked, well, I've worked a long time with uh, Bill Turnbull and Charles Moore, when he was still around too at the end there. And oh, yeah. they're very much within a canon of thinking that, I don't know, it, a lot of the work that's happening today, yours, other people, has a similarity. I'm not talking about the crazy Charles Moore stuff. Oh yeah, sure. I'm talking See, like no, the Sea Ranch, Ranch stuff. stuff. Yeah. 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 Sea Ranch, I, we have that, I have the book right on my desk right now, I've been reading it. But it's like the, 
you know, I, I think that stuff is interesting for sure. Yeah, I does... also think that we came out of a time, I don't know where, in, where we wanted to build, like there's a lot of the stuff going on that was, it was obvious it wouldn't, you'd need an incredibly rarefied client to be able to build stuff. And for us, you know, we, I mean, even floating house was a kind of, was a luck, a lucky project and it just happened, but it's like, we just wanted to build. That was one of the first things. And so we, we kind of built, tried to build a career and a thinking around stuff that we knew we could build also at the beginning. I mean, it's not, it's not like we didn't, we didn't come from the point of view where you have a pre, I think the people before us, the model, I mean, there's always different, ways to approach architecture like you can start with you have a clear theory and then you win the lottery or you are friends with lots of very wealthy people and you build this crazy thing or you can just start in a more um you know from what you have around you and we started with what we had around us and what was available in small ways and we still do i mean like we don't really we will do anything for the most part if it's, we think it's. They're there. How do you characterize? Can you hear us now? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, Stephen, how do, what do you think of this Neo Pomo stuff? Uh, truth, I would say that there is something contemporary that's happening that your work does engage. Uh, it's sort of a return to concept, uh, Not even intelligence, that. but I know what you're saying. And, and the problem with the Neo-Pomo is it's not postmodernism. It doesn't have the same political, uh, cultural motivation. It lacks on yeah. that level. It uses syntax, um, you know, like uh, in our class, I don't let them use latent arches. Uh, mainly because Arches, of course, represents imperialism and has this incredible history that if you just use it, you're, you're not being intelligent. doesn't mean you can't then use a half circle or even a U-shaped circle in an intelligent manner that kind of disrupts our, as just a geometry sometimes, or with contemporary digital technologies that can do things we couldn't do before. But it's not about being an Arch. And I think a lot of people I, just I think, are... the, I think it's super interesting problem what you're saying, but the, like for instance, for us at some point when we were students and, and younger, like let's say Venturi, uh, Scott Brown gets associated with Reaganism at some level. And, and it becomes, I don't know why it just does. It becomes with a kind of commercial, let's say commercial architecture and shopping malls and a kind of development attitude that post POMO, like Mike Graves for sure suffered that towards the end, gets kind of tied into this globalist, neoliberal capital scheme. I, I don't think, I think of anything we're, yeah. I would argue it's because it's easy. It's easy to digest. It's kind of no different than our friend Donald Trump wanting to do, um, Classes. Yeah, classes, cold buildings that could have a slight neo postmodern quality to it. Uh, he's doing it for fascist reasons, but there's an attempt to bring back, I guess, all the rules that are associated with classicism and people. Well, what do you, how do you, it's like with... the new urbanists. Remember them? Uh, yeah, sure. How do you deal with, though, like at the same time for me, like Zaha and that work? became associated with extreme luxury and it didn't, it's not an avant-gardist project either. It becomes, it becomes um, an extreme form of luxury and wealth that is very rarefied. I think if anything for us, we maybe are searching for a kind of blankness, but it's, it, which is a little different than the, I mean, I think the pink, you got us on the pink for sure. But at the same time with, but at the same time, the, what we were trying to do in those, in those drawings was for us, um, 
You are wearing pink, by the way. I know. The, the, um, the, the, was to show, to show the, like when we started doing those drawings, it was to show the screen. They were called screenshots for a reason because we were really interested in how we in our office, like just watching our office at the time and people working, students were all working in these polychromatic spaces. Like people would be setting up their backgrounds in, in Rhino and color and all the lines are colorful. And then when it came to presentations, you would go back to ink on Mylar kind of attitude, all black. At the time for us, it was like, we thought it was more interesting to show the screen the environment that we work in. Yeah, the real, like in a way, it was like, that was the point. I mean, I think the pink is also a feminist, you know, woman in architecture, where when I was a student, it was black, white, or maybe red. You know, there's very heavy handed limits of what you could do. Anything else was not serious. <laughs> there is a, uh, you know, a kind of we play with stuff. Yeah, in that no, way, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. With education, you know, you well, didn't have the kind of freedom to. Eisman did things. pink, I guess. Mm -hmm. But like the, <laughs> I don't. That's problematic. Yeah. yeah, well, but being able to make the claim that there's a politic behind your color choices, that shifts the discourse in some ways. It says you're actually thinking through how people understand the color, what they might interpret, how you might have meaning and value in that which isn't just a pure nonsensical use of pastel colors because they're popular and they appeal to the mass. Yeah, sure. A kind of, a kind of commerce uh, trend yeah. or something. Yeah, I think like we, we have always been, and even as a politic for us, we've always been interested in a kind of, I mean, part of our thinking has always been a kind of inclusionary discourse to some, at a very basic level. That's even why we did the scale figures mm -hmm. book um, to think about this kind of thing. Uh, I think representationally, we that was part of the project of the screenshots in a way. There is a, for us was a kind of a politics of inclusion, I suppose at some level, but I don't, sure. I'm sure it has its limits, but at least that was an intent. So yeah, we it's have not, yeah. We have a lot of questions starting to back up, actually. You're getting, people are getting really interested. Uh, yeah, so I might let them have a chance, but generally I just want to say one, I really do respect and appreciate your work, and I love that it's bringing back a uh, subtle intelligence, uh, concept and thinking, but still buildability and nuance. I think those are all extremely important. Even like your affordable planning, uh, the, the planning, the way in which you analyzed and diagrammed it, and actually creating sort of like a perimeter blocks with little community spaces inside. They're, they're very legible in their um, intention. Um, I never heard about the aluminum thing before. That's fantastic, by the way. Uh, okay, so uh, Cole, you can talk and ask your question. Are you there? We can read it. Uh, we can read it. It's more fun when they talk. Um, yeah. yeah he doesn't have a mic. Not oh, a sad yeah. face. Uh, Cole, you're, un you're muted. Can you unmute? Oh, oh no. He, he just said he doesn't have a mic. mic. Oh, he doesn't have a mic. All right. Well, then um, okay. I'll read it. I'll read it, and then you guys can answer. So, hi, Michael and Hillary. I'm curious about what your position is regarding organizational principles and systems. If the form of a project can always be other, the way a project is able to organize difference seems like all-encompassing strategy and a way to evade talking about form for form's sake. Would you be able to speak to how different organizational principles can affect the outcome of a project? Your house 10 yeah, cluster sure. comes to mind, the field of your info navit master plan, which you probably don't like yeah, that word yeah. master plan, as well as the drift software game you developed. Uh, would you call it aggregation, accumulation, questions? I think that, that, yeah, that's a good question. I mean, I, I'm not sure I'm, we'll have as a clear an answer, but I think we've always been drawn towards, um, if anything, the, the histories of architecture that we feel part of 
are those dealing with non-expressionist attitudes towards form. I mean, it's very, very, that's a very broad thing and it gets interpreted in many ways. So in some cases, I think for us, I think it, it's culturally defined in some level and it changes the, you know, in some level the parametric pro project for us, what became problematic for it was the collapse of positivism with expressionism, which are two things that I always thought of as separate and antithetical projects. Positivism being the kind of grid-like logic that we see a lot of times is the really, let's say, the really typologically reduced project, um, the nine square grid or something like this. And type project that, we, that you see in lots of different places like in Belgium, et cetera. And, the, and at the same time, we're interested in the kind of like free for all non-design of just collisions of things that I think was also a kind of, at one level, uh, and it was seen as trying to get rid of authorship and expression and willfulness and in certain ways. So we play with both of those histories, I think, some, in some cases. Um, you know, I think, like if you ask, and so, yeah, I don't know. So like House 10, I think what, if you look at that plan carefully, there are a lot of very kind of classic architectural games going on at the same time. So there's games of symmetry, uh, localized symmetry, rotation, like the, there is like a, I don't, we could go back to the plan, but there's, there's like, it's basically s symmetrical. And then there's an, a of, of units, and then there's an extra one added to throws everything off. And then there's a diagonal um, that there's one curve, which then produces a kind of diagonal symmetry, which is a separate thing. Anyways, there's a lot of these kinds of games that I think are just very old school games. And even things like um, the, the floor in a lot of our, our um, works, we deal with a lot of times like rotational hatches. And we're very aware, I mean, there's like, for sure there's postmodern nods in that kind of thing, I think, where you think about, I mean, one of the, you, you read like Frampton on the New York Five, one of the things he talks about in that book, in that he's, he's very critical in it, but one of the things he talks about is a kind of, um, he calls it righty and rotation for some reason. I don't know why it's not, not really righty and to me, but like where, you know, you rotate the grid of the floor to produce other effects of movement and kind of opening up plans and stuff. And we're, so we're aware of these kinds of histories and we tweak them and play with them in our own ways. Um, I think the looseness like in Font of Eat for us, well, only it isn't really there yet. The kind of looseness of that, the kind of drift, it will be better when the landscape is in. I think it looks for, it's to, to our eyes a little too, it needs something to hold it together like the landscape. It's still, it's still too raw a space almost, but it's when the trees grow in, it's gonna be better. In, in any case, it's just, um, but we, you know, we like this idea. One of the things, the point of that was that you could use repetition of elements. This was hopefully for the, the people involved, the housing community is like, if you, just, if you just take them off the grid, you can use the same elements to produce difference and variation and kind of different kinds of scale social spaces around them. That was part of our, uh, mm -hmm thinking and discussion with them. And we, we tested it out. This was a kind of laboratory for housing for them to think about things. Oh, what's the next one? We have a question Low res. Albert. Let's go to the beginning, Albert. Do you wanna ask your question? Yeah, hi. Um, thanks for all your insights, by the way. Um, I'm curious, um, all your projects have the, the appearance of extreme simplicity and low resolution. Is there anything that you don't typically share about your office process that explains how you actually do this? I know it's usually easier said than done. Um, my assumption is it's a highly technical skill set and a fascination um, with like getting things built. Albert, it's a good question. Um, we are kind of 
technicians. I mean, we don't sit around in, in the office and argue about like, is this low res or high res? Like we, we, you know, we're an office, we're an architecture office and we sit there and think about like, okay, how's that detail working? And how's that, how are we gonna deal with the plumbing here? And, you know, we are kind of like, um, but there's a lot of time spent on things where we're like, this just doesn't, you know, being an architect in an office and even the most academic architect and I think it's still at some level, I assume, I, this may not be true, is that you get in the office and you're working on stuff and you're like, ah, oh, it just doesn't seem right. We need to try something else. This isn't feeling right. You know, I mean, you know, at, at some level you still, there's other things going on in an office. It's harder to explain. We don't, we don't, um, it's not, it's, it's not, it's hard to, I mean, I, I think it's hard for me to explain. Maybe Hillary could do it better, but it's like, it's not technical all the time, although it is a lot of technical. It's not concepts all the time, but although we do talk about it sometimes. I mean, I think our answers are probably different yeah. <laughs> too, which also makes the, makes it a mix, right? That's why we also have the office together and, yeah. and work with other people in the office too. It's part of a conversation. I mean, I, I think we're for sure, we're, interested in a certain set of things, the, the set of things change. Um, I do think the previous work or things we, we look at, we think about, I mean, we've gone through it, um, we like it. Um, and so, you know, we, we kind of question those things and for sure as time changes, your perspective on things change. Um, so. Yeah, we are, like, I think we are interested in building a body of work, like Hillary's saying which already means something. So it already means that you start from somewhere in a way, Albert. It's like you're, you have to, you think about the other work you've done and how you're moving it in certain other directions or not. I, don't, I mean, we don't, um, you know, we don't start with a blank slate every time we get a new project. I would say there are other offices that have made that claim and they do that and you can see that in their work. Um, at least for me, I'm comfortable with saying things that we've done and things that we'll do in the future hopefully relate to each other in some way. Can't hear you. We can't hear you. Steven, your mic is muted. You're, you're, you're already muted you're you're yourself. Courtney, yeah. I want to ask yeah. a question. Hi there, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Be great to see your faces. I just I think talking to text they is on there. I don't think I'm able to do that. Oh. <laughs> um, so I just want to say that I love your office's drawing style. Um, and I was just wondering if you could speak a bit more on your relationship with graphic representation and in particular the use of pattern and animating with scale figures. And if you think that the drawings sometimes become as equally important as the built work. I don't think it's as important as the built work, but I think it's important. So I, for us, the built work is more important. Um, but we spend a lot of time thinking about drawings, about f models, about photography. We like everything we do. We it's it's considered. I hope at least, even if it. I think we try to give the appearance of it being really nonchalant at the same time like very like, oh, it's just a sloppy photo. But it's like, but there it's, it is, it is considered. Um, and there's usually a lot of work behind that, those images. Like those, they've kind of grown a little out of control. And at some level, I think we feel some guilt. We are, we're, the pomo thing and the pink and all that stuff that we, right. Stephen was talking about. There's some, no, it's okay. It's like, this is like a group therapy. Um, it's, it's like, um, you know, we feel some guilt or burden that we may be messing up a generation of architects, but we don't know yet. So we don't, you know what I mean? Like we might be influencing things in a bad way. So the, uh, I would just say for us, I wouldn't confuse the representation as being more important than the real world. Uh, we are really more interested still in building buildings and if, like we are we are we really do get excited about like 
even in the the child, like that this is going to affect children's lives in the petite cole, that this is they're going to have memories of going to this weird little place and learning about design for us that's exciting i mean that's mm -hmm. like wonderful yeah, sure. so thank you i think um jesse can you hear me hi uh can you hear me yeah great uh Hi, thank you so much for showing us so many pictures. Uh, I was curious about what you said at the beginning where you were designing and selling uh, kind of products, I put products in quotes, uh, but found it wasn't economically viable. You then went on to making lots of projects and with many of the houses you do are always thinking of these houses as in series or as products that can be made more uh, rather than one-offs. Do you think this is the aspirational role of the architect today? Something analogous to the product designer, in quotes? I th think we play with this thing of it as a kind of commodity, but not really, but like that, you don't think so? I, I would say the project in St. Louis, this is the first time, we'll see. The project in St. Louis, it, it, I think they're doing four of them. It's part of a master plan. It's the first time one of our projects is going to be repeated. We have now de not dealt with that before. So we're, yeah, maybe more, but it, it's supposed to be repeated. So we'll have to deal with this as it, it's the first time. I think like for us, we tend to, I don't, we don't really enjoy selling stuff. We're, we're not, we didn't get into architecture to, because we like business. I don't know, like that's not, that's not, wasn't our drive. Like we were like, oh, we really like business. So let's become architects. Um, we got into architecture because we are, we were, we're interested in, you know, a creative life, um, making things, think, reflecting on things. I, th I think it's an interesting question. I mean, it is something, you know, we've tried to make the office and maintain it as a small office. I mean, a lot of, there are a lot, most businesses are small businesses, right? As there's so much in the news we hear about, but, um, you know, to purposefully do that and do the things we do um, so we can work between buildings and books and objects and all of these things. I think the, the interest hasn't been so much to be commercial as it is to be engaged in the public and social in some ways. We do love also the community of architects, by the way, we do love our, our, our strange community of architects. Like we've had wonderful times and discussions with people who we only know, we meet and we only know their work. And, you know, you can spend time talking and, and, and communing about things. I think it's like, yeah, it's like, you know, it, I think we're very lucky. We, I think it's, there's a lot of problems with architecture as a profession. We could get into it. You know, I think there's, there's, there's a lots of things that I think are, that I wish were different. But at the same time, I really believe in the architect. <laughs> you know, I just think the architects, architects are amazing in kind of, in general, um, like, relatively altruistic. I mean, people, they, I think there's this always this thing that I think the architect's just some crazy thing, per, egotistical person. But the reality is I think that they really are, they're one of the few professions that's thinking about a public and a civic good still. So I, there's, there isn't too many people like that left. Walter, you want to ask your question? Hi, Walter. Is that a no? Yeah, I do agree with, by the way, uh, Cole, I think Yvonne has a really great smile. Yeah. <laughs> Yvonne, your smile is lighting up my screen here. Um, oh, good. Uh, Walter, are you out there for your question or you want me to ask it for you? He wants you to read it, I think is what he said. Okay, so hi, Michael and Hillary. Uh, thanks for the lecture and sharing your works. I'm interested in your choice of oblique drawings at a 90 degree angle with gradients background, maybe gradients. How did this, yeah, how did this style get developed over time? And what does it mean to you, clients, than a perspective drawing render? So the, 
the those really the gradient i would say is straight out of the software experiments that were done in processing in the 2000s early 2000s and why we did it it was easy to do honestly and it was seemed like a cool effect at the time i don't i can't even explain it it just felt right but you could just do it in a small bit of code say go from this color to this color and then it would just do it it was before it was before you could do it in Rhino and other th places. Like now, now you can do it everywhere. But it's like at the time, it was. It felt, it felt right, and it was sort of novel for us, I guess. And it came out of the software stuff. So if you look at these early software images of ours, they are all kind of gradients and the color shift. And it was a kind of we call it rainbow vomit. We did all this stuff that was a kind of misuse of a misuse of what we call uh, scientific software. You know, we were interested in that color palette of the gradient uh, rainbows of science. And so like in a way the simulation software, if you did uh, engineering, they would have, you know, you'd have like the great, you know, or temperature or something like this, it would have the scale and the shifting of colors and stuff. And we just try to take it as an aesthetic in a way that we liked and misuse it like kind of doing it wrong was what we talked about at the time doing like this this kind of expertise model and make like twisting it on its head so i mean I, I think it's important to know that you know when we were students we were before computers and then com computers were emerging and you know we never had classes in in representation like this in technology in these ways and so we have a very different relationship to to that and some of it is self learning and experimenting you know we had no one in our our you know head saying wait don't do that or oh, you can't use that program or you should no, learn that great. software right so for us it's you know we just sort of take what we can and we were at a, a great different attitude we had a great moment because we were at the thinking. smorgasbord of like downloads and it was like kind of all illegal software all the time everywhere and you could get anything you wanted yeah, but there and, weren't that many choices either. No, but you could so, get every. I remember. So, so we could learn things, and then you know. Now I'm paranoid. Things. We wouldn't ever do it. You know, it's like it's like you're paranoid. Well, the there's internet. so many choices. It's sort of like, it's like a stifling. Which do I start in? You know. I mean, but we, we would really play around with all this stuff. Like you know, at the time we were. I remember playing. You would just download everything and just play in it for a little while and see what it's like. And you know, let's try. It. Now it's like, you know, we were doing software. I mean, I don't. know, Maybe students still do this. I have no idea. But it seems like it's a different thing. They still do it. I just don't they, know where you get they, it. Anymore. They do. We we just don't have time to do what they do. You know. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Len, you want to ask your question? Oh yeah. Um, hi, Michael and Hillary. Um, first of all, thanks for an amazing lecture. I really enjoy the playful approach um, you as a practice exhibit in your projects, but. I would really like to address one of those projects in particular. It's Petita Call. I guess for me as a designer, the strength of the projects for children comes from the architect's kind of ut utmost aspiration of making children dream. So I wonder what do you consider to make this happen if you have the similar objective, whether you try to express it formally, compositionally, spatially, or it comes predominantly from scale and choice of texture, color. As expressed in dig, as expressed in in tectonics. Yeah, yeah. I think it's the scale thing. Thank you. Yeah, it's a really nice question. Thank you yeah. for that. Um, and I think it's a couple of things around that scale, um, just openness too, as well. I mean, for us, that it wasn't something enclosed uh, to keep it open, and then to think about occupying space between the ground and and the ceiling or the roof in this case. It's also the context. It's in this amazing, I mean, like, we didn't have to do that much because it's in this, like, kind of old stable building as part of the original Versailles complex, and it's just amazing courtyard it's in. So, it, I mean, like, it almost helped to be sort of abstract in that context. It, it sort of sets it off a little bit. The scale just shifts in a way because of that. Um, Maybe the sign as well. I guess yeah, the big you sign. know, there's a kind of obviously playfulness in that, but nod to other other sort of schools, design schools, etc. 
that it could fit with kids may not know that, but maybe they learned something. It was a really, I mean, it was a nice project to be involved in. We were lucky to be asked. There was, it was, um, uh, we were asked as part of a group of three architects to do different parts of things that are relative semi-permanent, let's say, uh, installations at the school. And we were, Jamel, Jamel gave us the uh, school, I think because of, because of Kravis Home or something. And I think our work, it, children, it was children related. I think our work, we're, we're overt. Uh, we, you know, we're vocal in that we like uh, kind of working with children and we like the kind of a childish attitude, let's say, towards architecture. And, um, but the other parts were great too. So there was, there was, uh, yeah, Go Hasegawa did a musical kind of bandstand. Fiona Fabe did a cafe, espresso bar, discotheque. Um, and it was a really nice group there. I think it all, I think, it, cause I do think all of the installations feel sort of magical in a weird way. And I think it's because they're just, you, I mean, hopefully there are those, as well, but they all feel magical in a certain sense because they're just of context. They just are different enough. They float. So to any of um, the participant students, do you guys have any questions to ask? It's been pretty quiet. Yeah, I got uh, I have a, uh, Go ahead. Any of them then Thank you, Zane. Um, yeah, I, so I'm, I'm wondering about how your ideas of low resolution and reworking the dwelling are having to having to adapt as you kind of move between scales because the the Anali project is has like this texture quality to it and a lot of your work uh, a lot of your work with homes are kind of very much like literally objects and fields and then there are projects that are in between like the, the DC project and the uh, the laboratory for living in Mexico so I'm, I'm curious about how you how the aesthetic um, adapts as it moves along that size gradient. You think? It's a good question. Um, hopefully the, I mean, it's a mysterious uh, problem for sure. Is like, how do you make uh, a set of very, I mean, this is the problem of an architect in a way. It's like, how do you make all these very different things feel like they're related to each other? Um, I mean, every project is, even if it's a house, it's a different client, different site, different budget. Um, uh, and then that doesn't take into account like everything else, you know, that we're talking about, like all the different program scale shifts. I think I don't really have a, like a formula. I just think we try to do it. So we just try to make things relate or we try to have it build upon each other. So how does it work? I mean, usually I would say like the, the urban projects, they deal with um, they have more good grids and they have more like they have like they have more urban qualities perhaps because of that and then the objects in the field or floating in the water don't I mean, but I, I don't know I think there is a um, a definite kind of straightforwardness to the projects that are approached, I would say we have some sort of method, I would hope at this point, <laughs> right? Um, you know, that, that we're concerned with a certain set of things. I think yeah, economics no, is one, local, to, um, you know, there are looking at what's been built already nearby, you know, do these things fit in some ways, but that they're also, you know, stripped down slightly. Um, part of it has to do with budget in some ways. I mean, we are, none of our projects are uh, high-end, luxurious projects, right? So that in itself produces a certain ethos or yeah, philosophy it, yeah. around how we how we make something or what's accessible. Like the pro the affordable housing thing. Like we have, we get in there. We're very um, involved. So, like for instance like we fight over window sizes, like, you know, a, a developer or a contractor comes back and says, oh, you know, we, we don't have the budget for these windows. We're gonna have to go with these cheap, horrible things. 
And then we say, wait a second, what's your budget? And then we spend like two weeks on the phone calling everybody we can think of, trying to find some other window that's better and bigger and stuff. You know, we're get, we get involved in the process. I do think there are things that we care about like that are harder to discuss, which is like proportions of things and scale, scale and proportion, which I think goes across a lot of the projects. And it's not really, you know, we do use similar size windows in all the projects we try to, which is a size, like a kind of body size. It's the most you can see in the US. So it's like, you know, which is a, you can't, you can only warranty up to 49 square feet foot insulated glass, at least that we found in a cheap window, cheap enough window. So we got to go with the seven by seven a lot or the, you know, around there. So, I mean, I don't, I'm not sure I understand the question with the, the comment about the texture. I worry that that somehow reduces, like it's trying to categorize the work in a way that I, I, I worry it's like misread or if there's some, there's some intent on our part that that's part of the project of the, the office texture. or something. That's part of the question. So oh, it's, um, it's, I mean, a texture. Yeah. it's a texture. It's a texture. What does I, that mean? Yeah, I don't, I don't oh, know. Oh, a texture, like a feel, like a carpet or something yeah, or a... Yeah, but I don't know. I mean, I think there's... Yeah, yeah, that's fair. A mat, a mat building. No, I think that was a thought. The biennial? Yeah, the biennial. Yeah. He's talking about the uh, Venice uh, 2016. Oh, I see. Uh, yeah, that's yeah. true. I suppose. And for sure, I mean, that was like a, I mean, we went into it as a knowing it's not a real project. Uh, and we had done, hmm. uh, yeah. well, we knew, I mean, yeah, we also were b building off of kind of work that we had done at MoMA. In the foreclosed show. In the foreclosed show, which was thinking about, um, these kinds of like, like we were asked to do social housing and like, then the problem is like, well, where, what is the social space left in society? And the only thing we could find were the streets really, which isn't really even that's like, it's the, one of the few public spaces, let's say, in some of these areas that isn't already owned, like everything else was already owned and you have to go through ownership to get it to built and buy it in a way. And so, um, we were building a kind of off of that in Venice and then also experimenting. I mean, it was a very fast project, but we were trying to think about, again, um, buildings without fronts and without streets in a way. And a kind of post uh, automobile logic, perhaps. Although we did have cars, I think, in there, but they were like little cars. So. Same. <laughs> Good questions. Unmute. Go ahead. All right. Um, so thank you guys so much. That was a great presentation. Um, I want to. I had a lot of questions, kind of about the the simpleness and how you really honed it in and got to that. But that's was definitely covered. So appreciate you guys answering those questions. Um, but I kind of want to get into how and why you kind of framed it as these projects kind of being a new um, kind of normal for the residential housing. And also if, if you really take that to heart and see a future where like there are a ton of this new kind of vernacular style um, kind of that's ubiquitous all around the country, the world. Um, oh. and, and already you've mentioned that one of your projects is now um, possibly gonna be like a duplicate of it. Um, and so how that kind of factors into it and yeah, so it's I mean the fact what do you, how do you deal with yeah, if it's like um, I think it's a good question good question. It's sort of like uh, about difference and repetition at some level, right pieces um, I don't know we're in a tough spot like I said we want to we do want to build which means you have, and you want, and you, we don't have access to huge amounts of capital. So there are certain things that we can, and even our clients, all, all our projects are very cheaply built. Inexpensive. Well, Inexp well they're, oh yeah, they I don't. Low cost. Low cost. Low dollar. They're, they're not, they really are. We're, I mean, I think we do, we do some magic with very little money a lot of times. And usually the magic involves us actually building parts or getting involved in some way but um um yeah so what do you, i mean 
can you can you rephrase it again for us like how the problem of seeing the copies or seeing it like seeing that what we do is easy or easy or copied or what is or, it? yeah no 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 not not to say no not, not like that at all um i'd say let's see what's the best way to this in terms of is the goal i guess for you guys to be like oh to be a in, for the grander architecture world to see this and be like this is the way it should go oh, or it should no, be no. more like this like a modern yeah new yeah. universal or is it or something yeah no no yeah. we're not doing that okay. i mean i don't we don't know what will happen but I, I i it would be i would one be shocked i'm even shocked that people uh look at our stuff in general <laughs> but like the 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 you know what i mean like the I, I don't I don't know. We're just we really are like Hillary said. We we have consciously we're small. I mean we're a small office. We're very ma and pa. I know that, that sounds corny and nobody believes it. I hear Liz Diller always says the same thing too. We're mom and pop and I. Right. So um, the which I think is great. So it's hard to say that when when Liz is saying it, but it's like the but we really are, we live above our office. Like our kids are in the office all the time. Um, you know, we all have lunch together well, a lot I of think, times. I mean, I think with respect to the work, it's a matter of, you know, again, like wanting to do more work in the public, but I think yeah, it's very specific projects and a certain set of things, housing, um, schools. I mean, I think we have a certain sense of things we'd like to work on. Um, and even in saying that, I mean, I think it's also a certain scale of work, um, although we differ on that. I always say I don't want to ever do a skyscraper, but, you know, I, mean, I, don't know. I would do one. Michael yeah. says nothing's off the table, but in any yeah. case, so I think some of that is. It depends on the context. Anyway. But okay. I, yeah, I don't, I think it's. Maybe I want to take a little bit on that vernacular discussion because it did come up during your lecture and I think it relates a little bit to Zane's question. Um, you know, gabled roofs, vernacular architecture, um, you seem to have an interest in it. It's kind of, it's not modern per se. I mean, Sea Ranch was modern because they, you know, they eliminated eaves. They did a lot of things to make it geometric. They were very, they were pushing it, but they still wanted to maintain a vernacular relationship to a barn. Right to the, the localized condition. Yeah, the wood, the wood. Yeah, and the very for us, the fur, but yeah. you guys are doing houses and housing, and so one of the cartoon aspects of a house is it looks like a house, but then what makes your work yeah. and Jennifer Bonner's work maybe a little more savvy is it doesn't just look like a house, right? I mean, there you've got some complex roof forms, which are, actually aren't very expensive. Once you do a couple, you realize it's just a you know a slight angle difference but people can work that out in the field so you're not adding yeah. cost but you're adding interest and complexity there's something more to it um, and i guess there's a concern if i'm misreading or reading zane's question that well it's hard from an outsider sometimes to wonder whether this is just a house oh so these guys do like architecture that looks like every other architecture stuff that isn't even architecture is developer work for houses when you're not, but it, it, No, I don't think it looks, I don't think most people who see it and people who work on it are generally like think it's weird, but like huh. the, and when they, I mean, I, it, it isn't, I think the scale thing matters maybe a little bit more. It's maybe hard to see in photos, but even like say the photographer studio, the roof is very large. I mean, proportionally, even when you go there, it has quite a presence. It's like, it is, it is hovering. And um, and enough to make it even him as a client and us a little bit unsettled. Like, is this a little too big? You know, I'm kind of like, but um, the and even some of the other houses, I would say the same thing. It's like there there's a there is a kind of maybe it's the simplicity that you're talking about. There's a there is a kind of abstraction to them in the expression of them. The kind of blank like the way that the the well, the standing seam works on some of them. It's kind of this galvanized, very cheap material, uh, galvalin, uh, uncoated galvalin at all. But it's done, it's cussed, there, there is, it's a lot of stuff though, when you do it, that scale, it's rolled, it's like folded on site. They have these machines that just pop them out. And 
you know, we just set it up for a slightly different than the standard um, spacing and, and do other things with it, you know, like the way that we detail it, it becomes sort of like, you know, they would usually add other materials bits here and there and we figure out detailing to get rid of it. So it has a kind of little more, I think it looks a little different, but um, it is a good question and it is a kind of concern. And I suppose at some level, what could we do about it? Like, I think we are who we are at this point. I mean, I like, I don't know, you know, we are, we are not, are, are not probably like in a way Venturi, Scott Brown, we, we are interested in starting maybe with the world a little bit as opposed to some alien intelligence from above coming down and changing the world. I mean, there's a lot of thought and intelligence in the vernacular or whatever we want to call it, even in commercial buildings. There are a lot of very smart people. I, we don't assume to be smarter than everybody else that have spent a lot of time figuring things out. And we try to learn from them. So, and figure out how to play with it a little bit. Uh, Zach, do you want to ask your question? Yeah, I think there, there is an earlier question that was posed in the um, chat. If they want to go, I think they, they asked at 6.30. Um, it's okay, I was gonna end with Jesse's question. So just you go. Oh, okay, okay, gotcha. Um, yeah, first off, amazing lecture. Thank you guys for taking the time to spend some virtual time with us. Um, so you kind of began your, re your lecture. Um, it's real, in, it's real. Yeah, um, you yeah. began your lecture in phrasing, you know, uh, building objects from like the spoon to the city, which I think was a great opener for the, to the lecture. Um, and I, I'm curious, in your work with how um, with a lot of your projects you're able to kind of design very detailed objects objects within the space that you you also design so I guess I'm just kind of curious do you ever find yourself either limited or um, kind of going crazy over the details or do you kind of jump back and forth in scales or how do you um, in terms of keeping yourself centered in designing either objects or spaces um do you find yourself like having to force yourself to stop designing like larger spaces when let's say you're designing objects and vice versa or i guess i'm just kind of curious um how that works in your in your practice we jump around a lot from scales i think i think it's like we we're jump everyone in the office jumps around i think it's probably one of the the downsides of working in our office it may be, or the upside, depending on how you want to look at it. But it's like, um, we're always like the same week, you could be doing a chair, stool, light fixture, master plan, be on the phone with um, product companies trying to figure out something, whatever it is, you know what I mean? Like, it's, it's very, I think it's typical of a small office. I think in terms of how to know when to stop and what the limits of design are, um, good question. I think we, you don't really know. I mean, I, Hillary was reminding me, I forgot about this, is like I was obsessed with door handles as a student and like she was making fun of me, I think the other day about this, but like the, like the you know, way. yeah, in the, it's, so, that, it's now gone to the door, so now it's, it's maybe doors it's and up. a set of doors, and then it becomes a closet, and then it's, you know. <laughs> I like, like, people like, you know, certain architects, I thought, I've always liked architects that, that are, that know how to make things. Yeah, I think, you know, we're just, it's also about creating an office environment, um, studio space, call it the office but you know it's more of a studio than it is really an yeah. office but we're a, a real business at the same time but how to how to co-mingle those things and create a certain kind of energy and, and place to work and we have a little shop it's a lot of work yeah. um you know but we will little have shop. models and books and you know all these things are on the go all the time so that's really important for us to keep that level of energy and interest in design happening because if, you know you don't know where something comes from in terms of what's next of projects and um, anyone can visit our office and um, you know we've had great 
luck in people coming to see us and leaving and hiring us for work and wanting not just a, a, maybe a building uh, project, but then also furniture or something else. And so, um, and everything also that you see in our lectures, we've made these things, we, we live with them, we work with them. Um, so we're, we try out, we have a lot of the- We have all the failures. Misfits and uh, yeah. We always say we live with all of our mistakes. You learn kind of, one thing you learn is like, when you start out and you like, like these, this is something you just learn as you, you'll see, is like you, you design tables that are really wobbly I feel like everybody makes wobbly tables when they start out. And then you realize after time what the problems are and you stop making wobbly tables. Like you want to believe you can make it this table thinner and with less stuff. I mean, we still actually make some wobbly tables, but like the, but it's like, but you want to believe you can outsmart gravity when you're young and you can do all this stuff. And then you just, tr you just have to experience trying a bunch of times and then you learn the world is like it is for certain re reasons and then you have to figure out how to move it and operate within it like you know there's a lot of intelligence out there like usually i remember we're starting out and like designing tables and working with a woodworker and they would just be like this is crazy I, even i heard this great stories when i started teaching at uh, i don't know if you, edward seckler was there when i started teaching at harvard and he, he was this, he used to, he was the original cl uh, client. He worked with Corb on Carpenter Center in a way. He's old, it's, he must be gone now. He was in his nineties then. And he would tell me stories about, he worked with the same carpenters that worked with Adolf Lowe's. And he would say, he would say, which I thought was amazing how, how short, how, how close history is in a way. It's not that far away. It's really, like this blip, you know, that we're still in. And the, um, and he said that they would all complain how irrational Los was. He was just like ridiculous. He wanted to make like, get rid of all the structure where they had needed it. And he, he couldn't make it, design anything. His tables were horrible, you know, whatever. They were just making fun of him. And I think that's kind of wonderful. I mean, in a way it's like, we all, it maybe doesn't change much. We all are, kind of wanting things that maybe aren't totally practical, but we figure out how to do it. And you adapt and grow it as you get older. So it's like, we have some really horrible tables that we live with still, you know, my wobbly, probably Jesse, hurt somebody. Jesse, you wanna unmute and ask the last question? Thank you, by the way. Uh, sure, thank you. Sorry to bring it up again, it's just um, as I'm, going into my summer thesis, the kind of the question is very personal to me about like how we kind of think about the role of the architect uh, today. So my just my second question was that the balance between designing everything and being altruistic is especially interesting for the architect today. Can you speak about how you kind of hold this duality between being enmeshed in a community of creators as well as taking on um, in many ways, designing everything, buildings, furniture, clothes, bags. We don't, we, yeah. No, we don't always, I mean, I think the idea of total, like, like a self, if it becoming sort of narcissistic or self, mm -hmm. like, but I, like, for instance, I, I don't know if, I mean, we do, maybe we do more than we should. It's, it's a good, it's a reasonable critique, but something like, we're excited about group projects for sure. Like the thing that we like about, um, We've enjoyed working with other architects a lot. Uh, in fact, a lot of our work, I think, is from other architects. But it's, but like the cabin project, we're just we're talking today about cure, like trying to get other design. Like we were just saying how it would get to be too much if we did everything. So but we need to find other people to do parts of it and things that we know would do it better than us. Certain things. You know, maybe this is sort of too earnest question or answer in a way, but I mean, some of it is just really also about a need for things um, in our own office, and we design things that we can use. Um, and sometimes, you know, we just try things out, and then they become something. Also, you can't help it if you. I mean, I think we and also I would prefer to make things than buy things. Yes, know? we like <laughs> so make. That's we don't... a very strong ethos from when I was growing up as a kid and yeah. where I grew up. So I think some of that is just a part of, you know, who you are as a 
as an individual and, you know, creative, I think also this idea of creative life is super important. Um, and it's, it's, you know, it, I think it's a rare thing because there's so much pressure to conform to things or to do the things that came before or, you know, we certainly live in a very litigious society. And so you will have pressures to, yeah, to, to not to do the minimal risk possible. And that is very, um, you know, that's discouraging and um, it doesn't make you want to work on something if that's the, you know, if that's the thing you're designing toward, right? So, we like, yeah, I like what Hillary was just saying in terms of, I think it's a, I, I don't know what your experience has been like, but I remember as a kid, like, and this is true, like just our personal experience in life is like, our, like going to visiting my grandparents and like they made everything. I mean, they weren't designers, but they made, my grandfather built the house and made the furniture and made the wine or whatever. I mean, like, like weird gooseberry wine, I remember, but it was like, like, you know, they would make everything, pickle their own stuff. I mean, it was just a different time. It wasn't like you had to know how to do things in a way. And you had to, you know, you, you had to make things. You wouldn't buy everything. And I kind of, we kind of make a lot of stuff too, but we don't, it's like Hillary said, it comes out of a, both, I would say it's a, some level need is one thing, but also just a, a desire to make things. I mean, there's sure limits and it can get horribly claustrophobic, I'm sure at some point, but the, just, for now we are enjoying it. I mean, for someone else, it may be their nightmare. Mm. I don't know, but it's okay. Try to make, I mean, it's also like just being drawn towards things. Yeah. Okay. Well, um, are we gone? Yeah. I think that was awesome. Hillary, Michael, are you guys not with us? You can't hear me say goodbye. You're back. I don't yeah, know. Better. You're here. Great. Hey, thank you. That was that was wonderful. It was a great can you hear us? See us? I can hear you and I can see you. Um, and then to the attendees, thank you all for um, participating, joining in, asking questions, and uh, our students as well. A lot of fun. Uh, we'll be back next Thursday uh, with uh, Mark Foster Gage, and we'll continue on the conversations. Uh, so to all of you. Have a great night. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you everybody.